looking at the origins of abstract art. How did we get from representational art to non-objective art? And before we get started, I do think it's important to sort of define um, what abstract art is. And for the artists of the early 20th century, um, abstract art really represented freedom. Um, they were no longer uh, solely focused on recreating uh, the representational world. Uh, finally, they were given these new tools, these new ways to express um, our emotions, uh, the immaterial world, our spirituality. So when we're talking about abstract art, I want you to keep that phrase in your head, freedom. And then what also, um, when we're talking about abstract art, what tools did they have that they didn't have before? Well, again, they were not trying to um, capture the natural world, they were exploring a uh, new subjective world, and they were using a new language. Um, they were redefining what it meant to use uh, shapes, color, line, size, scale, all of those things to create uh, these new types of compositions. Um, and one thing that's exciting about these paintings is that the meaning is within the painting itself. You're not looking at the painting, looking for symbols, uh, to tell you a story or something that, you know, uh, is a landscape of a familiar place. Really, the meaning for the paintings, they, is they are self-defining objects. So, uh, when we talk about Western art, really from the Renaissance forward, um, it's all about uh, trying to reproduce this illusion of a our visible reality and here we have Raphael's the school of Athens at the Vatican and remember this is a blank wall I mean it's a flat wall a plaster wall and what did Raphael do to it he created this incredible illusion of space using the one point perspective to create this incredible illusion going so far back of a space that doesn't even exist that's one of the things I find so fascinating is that we were creating these impressions of the real world, but often um, they were imaginary places. So here we have Raphael taking us to this imaginary place. And art really for the next 500 years is focused on capturing all the nuances of the natural world. And here we have this wonderful Rubens. We've got... Um, his study of what happens to landscapes the further you go back you know here in the foreground it's very warm as you get further back it gets cooler and cooler and uh less and less in focus we even have him studying uh, the effects of after the rain shower or we've got a rainbow and again this wonderful perspective starting here in the foreground this zigzag going back if you follow the light all the way through from the foreground, middle ground, all the way to the background. So here's somebody, a master, an old master, um, putting all of his efforts towards capturing the effects of the natural world. And we start to see in the early 19th century, um, artists trying to capture almost something beyond the natural world. And when we have an artist like Turner, who is less interested in depicting the boats in the foreground, the harbor along the shoreline. He's really interested in trying to capture these atmospheric effects. And through that, he starts to create these paintings that if you just blocked out that ship, you would have a hard time knowing immediately what you're looking at. But he was really trying to capture this sort of, you know, how did these things through these colors and through these effects make him feel. And the Impressionists uh, took this a step further. Um, here we have basically the same thing, right? We've got ships, we've got a harbor, we've got a, set, a, a rising sun, but the Impressionists have taken that idea of what do we really see? You know, do we see everything like in this Rubens, do we look at the world that way? No, we take, you know, almost little snapshots and then we sort of pull them all together. And with the Impressionists, that's really what they were after, was trying to capture these impressions of light and of atmosphere. So you can see it's sort of like art is slowly deconstructing 
the natural world. And I love this painting <clears throat> by Whistler. Um, and again, there are very few representational subjects in this picture. There's some figures here in the foreground, and you can kind of tell there's maybe a pathway there. But what's the rest of this painting of? It's a beautiful painting. It's of fireworks. It's of a celebration. And <clears throat> when you look at that painting it c and you take out those figures in the foreground, it becomes a beautiful abstract expressionist painting that you would expect from the mid-20th century. So he's really studying our visual sensation. Think about when you do watch fireworks, how visually stimulating that is. That's what he's interested in capturing, this visual, this new uh, way of capturing these visual sensations, much more so than just painting um, the objects that are a part of the scene. So that brings us up to the end of the 19th century, when we start to see artists, again, uh, taking us further and further away from our visual reality. Cezanne believed that you could take all forms and... Um, reduced them down to their most simple elements. And what were those elements? He believed that the spear, the cone, the cylinder, that's all you needed to recreate the natural world. But what's interesting is when he reduces everything, when he compresses everything to these elements, he's less interested in how they relate to each other in space. So often with his paintings, it looks like things are ready to roll off the table. Things are not flat the way they should be. In a way, he's much like the Cubists, showing us two different angles at the same time. And that's what makes his paintings have this sense of tension. They're beautiful, but there's tension there. And when you look at some of his landscapes and see this wonderful reduction in terms of using... Uh, as little detail as possible to convey these shapes, to convey these forms. Look at this painting. It's almost abstract. It's just a few colors. It's just a few shapes, just a few lines. That idea of, you know, uh, trying to get things down to their most um, basic elements. That is uh, what these artists were after. So at the same time that that's happening, there's another offshoot called uh, Expressionism, which sort of takes root in the late 19th century. And instead of looking outside to the natural world, which Cezanne is still doing, these artists decide that art can also be used to look at our inner world, our psychological world. And they start painting these new types of paintings that are Yes, they have representational elements, but they're not about painting nature. They're really about exploring our mind. And especially in the, our age of pandemic, we can relate to Edvard Munch and the scream, and we all understand that what he's trying to express, right? We can look at that painting today, over 100 years later, and still connect with this idea that he was looking at, um, you know, studying what it's like to feel like you need to scream. <clears throat> so we, again, see that slow, I want you to feel this slow turning away from a focus on depicting the natural world to this focus on depicting our, you know, inner world, our emotional and spiritual world. And I think that all of us, you know, I'm so fascinated by Vincent van Gogh because, you know, during his lifetime, he was a very everyone would call him a failure. He was an unsuccessful artist. He was an unsuccessful minister. He was an unsuccessful everything. But people connect to his work. And it's not because he knew how to paint this landscape like Rubens did. It's because he was really pouring, you know, uh, that expressive side, that subjective side, the way that he saw beauty in the world into his pictures. And one thing I talk about with our artists all the time, it's all about connection. If you're painting something that you're truly, that you believe in, that you're truly connected to, then there's a chance that an observer is going to feel that connection too. And I really think that Vincent van Gogh was almost overly connected to his work. 
And that's why when we stand in front of it, we really feel something honest and truthful. Taking it a step further, Matisse at, and the Fauves, the Fauves were uh, a group of artists in the early 19th century. Uh, Fauve means wild beast. Everybody thought they were crazy because of the intense colors that they used. Um, and again, taking a step further away from the natural world into this world where color is not connected to what it would be naturally. I have never walked out into a landscape like this. Um, if you have, please let me know where it is. But this is a world that he has created and he wants these colors and this interplay of figures to speak to you in a certain way. He wants this uh, to be about the color, less so about the figures in the landscape. And look how the figures have been reduced to very simple lines. Look at this figure right here in the foreground. Very, I mean, that's almost, I mean, that's barely a, a doodle. But it's there, and it still has weight, and it's still representational, and we can still read it. But it's less about, again, creating, sculpting a three-dimensional figure on a two-dimensional plane. It's more about how does this explosion of color make you feel? And you can, you know, here in French, um, the good life, basically. This is a, he wants you to feel like you want to be a part of this world. And, I, you know, again, this is all happening so fast. And I want you, when you look at these pictures, it's easy to be, you know, not jaded, but we've seen them before, right? We've, we had our Art History 101. We saw the little postage stamp in the Janssen book um, of all these pictures. Most of them were probably in black and white. But things were happening and changing so fast in the late 19th and early 20th century. I just want you to feel the excitement that these artists were feeling when they were creating these things, and also when people were seeing them for the first time. It was, I mean, knocking people's socks off. Everybody was talking about this new language that these artists were exploring. And I also want you to remember that great art back then, I, I, it was the equivalent of movies or Netflix or all those things. People lined up and bought tickets to see famous paintings. So this is not happening in a bubble. This is not happening in someone's studio. This is something that everyone's talking about and everyone is celebrating. So here we have Matisse, and look how the figures have even been reduced more from what we saw in this painting, which is only three years before this painting, and they've almost become, you know, re unrecognizable. They're just barely there as figures. It's becoming more and more about the line and the color and how many colors are in this painting. Again, that idea as an artist, if you can keep simplifying and reducing what you need to get your point across, you know, that was part of the goal of what these artists were doing. This painting has four colors in it. The green landscape, the blue sky, their flesh tones, and their hair. That's it. And we all know this painting. And we all, it all makes us feel better, right? So it's all about this, you know, this emotional response that the artist is trying to get from you. And I do think it's fascinating how these artists, you know, we're going to talk a lot about the formal terms in art in a minute, but um, formal in art means sort of the elements that we've got to use, you know, color, line, um, tone, all those things. But color was what fascinated them because they felt like they could do anything with color. They can make things flat, like in this painting. They can use color to make things have form if they want. You know, they're not having to worry about line in order to create these contours and planes. They can rely on color for almost all the, you know, what they're trying to express. So color, keep thinking about color and how they're using color in new ways. And again, all that hinges on the fact that color is not tied to the natural world anymore. You can have color do whatever you want it to do. So if suddenly color is not tied to the real world, think of these endless opportunities. Remember that word freedom that we talked about earlier. Suddenly these artists are free to do whatever they want with color. That had never, ever 
happened before now. And I just wanted to walk you through a few uh, paintings by Matisse from uh, the 19 teens leading up to World War I. And I just want you to see how close he gets to pure abstraction. So we, we all know the dance, right? Very close to abstraction, but still grounded in the representational world. If I didn't have the title on here, would you be able to tell me what that is? And if you, the title here is View of Notre Dame. And once you know that, you go, oh, okay, yeah, I can see those towers. I can see Notre Dame, and, you know, here's sort of the, the road leading up to it, this little bit of perspective there. But look how close he's getting to that idea of pure abstraction. It's just, we're, we've had it reduced even more. We've got the blank canvas. We have blue, black, and green. You know, before we had four colors. Now we're down to three. Again, that reduction is so important for them. How effectively can they communicate their message? And I mean, just love this painting. And how close is it to abstraction? We're almost there, right? But you read the title, it's a, it's a French, it's a window, a French window. So here he is painting this window and reducing it to its most simple elements. And look what it becomes, you know, just a few strips of color. And this one here, the yellow curtain. And you can kind of see what appears to be sort of a curtain rod over here and the fabric wrapped around this side of it. And maybe this curtain is blowing in the wind and this is the sky and this is the window. Is that what he's trying to tell us? Maybe, but I think he was more interested in this color play. These big, bold shapes, these big planes of color that he's created. And it's such a great, happy painting. And again, when we think about the, our emotional response to these pictures, compare that one. What is our emotional response to this? Much like the Mona Lisa, depending on how you feel, you're probably going to get something different from this painting from day to day. But it's definitely a less optimistic painting than this one, right? And it's basically the same thing, right? It's a window. So with Fauvism, they continue to push the boundaries of what color can do, but they're still rooted in the representational world. So here we have, you know, again, this city scene. You can recognize the steeples in the background and the light on the water. Crazy colors, but still very much uh, rooted in the representational world. But the Fauves have sort of blown the top off of what color can do. And then we have the Big Bang. And I'm, I hope all of y'all are familiar with this painting. This is uh, Picasso's, one of his masterpieces. It's unfair, he got to have more than one masterpiece. But this painting really takes a lot of the developments, a lot of the advancements that we had seen up to this point and um, incorporates them all into one picture. What am I talking about when I say that? Well, first I want you to realize it's a big picture, okay? When you go and see this painting at the Museum of Modern Art in New York, it's a big painting. These figures are larger than life size. So when something's big like that, especially when they're bigger than life size, there's already sort of a confrontational element because they're sort of staring down at you. Who are these people? <clears throat> Well, as I was saying just a minute ago, there is, you know, all these elements being incorporated within this painting from all of the advances from before that are going to lead us into the next chapter, which is cubism, which launches us into pure abstraction. But when we're looking at these figures, who are they? Because, you know, for me, context is meaning. Yes, I think it's important when you go to a museum, Look, see how that painting makes you feel. Spend 30 seconds with it. See what it reveals to you. And then take some time and look at the label and 
read the you know, passage that's there because context is meaning. If you didn't know that you were looking at a scene from a brothel, you know, that changes this picture. These are five prostitutes from a brothel in Barcelona, and they don't look very alluring to me. If anything, they look confrontational. There's an element of violence to them. And why is that? Well, I mean, they are capturing our gaze. The three in the middle are looking right at us. And even the woman who's in profile, her eye has been moved to the side of her head to stare right at us. But they have where you would expect lots of curves. Everything is angular, right? It's all about these disjointed bodies. And how did he achieve that? Well, he had influences. And I think it's fascinating when I was going back to work on this presentation, how many contemporary events influenced Picasso's painting. Paul Cezanne, who had been a hero of a lot of these early modern artists, um, had a huge retrospective at the Louvre. The same, the year before, Picasso painted this painting. So all the young artists are going to the Louvre and they're saying, that guy, that guy got it. Cezanne knew what he was doing. He was ahead of the curve. And what can I take from him and use in my pictures? And again, that idea of spear, cone, cylinder, you can see Picasso very clearly using those forms in his picture. <clears throat> and again, artists love to go back and figure out, okay, who was, who of, of those artists, artists that came before me, um, who do I want to draw inspiration from? And from the old masters, you know, someone like El Greco, who stands out as being very strange compared to all of the other painters from the 17th century. Um, one of Picasso's friends purchased this painting. Two years before he did this painting, and it was in his friend's studio, and Picasso talked about El Greco all the time. And if you look clearly at El Greco's, the opening of the fifth seal, you can see structurally so many elements Picasso has incorporated into this painting. The balance is there, the movement is there. I mean, it's really fascinating if you spend, you could do a whole master's thesis comparing these two pictures. If we walk through the painting, you can see lots of different influences uh, taking place in these figures. Um, we are all familiar with Egyptian uh, hieroglyphs and how they you know, expressed themselves. The, the Egyptians had a very rigid formula about how they depicted the natural world. And <clears throat> one thing that makes you know, this type of depiction so unique is that Everybody's in profile, but their eye is looking straight at you from the front. So they have taken the eye, and instead of keeping it in profile, they have moved it over here because they thought that was more efficient. And Picasso has done the exact same thing over here. This woman is in profile completely, but her eye is directed straight at us, just like with Nefertiti over here. And I love that she has on this almost... Asian looking sarong dress, very, you know, which this Egyptian queen looks like she could have been wearing as well. Um, Picasso was Spanish and he loved to talk about how great Spain was to all of his uh, French contemporary artists. He loved to rub their noses in it. And again, I love these contemporary events that are happening. Um, there was an exhibition of Iberian sculpture in Paris in 1906, the year before he created this painting. What is Iberian sculpture? It's ancient Spanish sculpture. So think about, go back to antiquity 2,000 years ago. These are the types of sculptures that were being made in Spain. And Picasso was always talking about how great these sculptures were 
So much so that a friend of his, while at the Louvre, stole an Iberian sculpture for Picasso, and they all got in lots of trouble. So you can see directly that influence between the two. And then last but not least, when we look at this painting, it's hard to get past these, some of these figures without thinking of African masks. So in the late 19th, early 20th century, Europe is dividing up the continent of Africa. And France took part in that and brought a lot of sculpture and mass back to Paris. And there was a very large exhibition, again, at this exact same time, exploring the sculpture, the mass, the art of these African countries in Paris. And it started with Matisse, but it became very... Uh, chic amongst these art communities, amongst these artists, to collect African art. And we actually have this picture of Picasso in his studio as a young man. He didn't have much money, but what was he spending it on? African art. He believed that it was uh, truer than what he was seeing in a lot of European art. And so he starts to incorporate some of these elements into his paintings. And some of them, you can really see direct relationships between them. That long nose, small eyes, small mouth. I mean, it looks like you could take this mask off of her and it would become this. This is a, always, I think, a funny Picasso quote. A head is a matter of eyes, nose, mouth, which can be distributed in any way you like. So it shows there are no rules for them in the early 20th century. And just to show you how important the uh, influence of African art was on Picasso, for about five to 10 years, just about everything he did had some element of what he was observing from African art in his, in his work. And I just threw this in there because we always miss it. Anytime you got a painting with five prostitutes in it, you might miss the still life in the foreground. <laughs> I love this little pre-cubist grapes and it looks like pears maybe on this table. And look at this wonderful table. It's going like straight up. So the world has been, all these planes are being used and thrown at us in ways that they never have been before. So he's packed a lot into that picture. Just think of all the influences that we just talked about. All the things that were happening in Paris, which was the center of the art world at this time, all being packed into this one painting. So from that, we see Picasso and Brock, uh, two artists working in Paris, uh, develop this idea of cubism. And much like this painting, it feels like we're looking at these five figures, we're seeing them from multiple points of view at once. It doesn't quite add up, right? And that's what cubism is all about. How many ways can we look at this woman playing a mandolin and put all those puzzle pieces into one painting? It's no longer a flat two-dimensional surface. It becomes very sculptural because you're looking at things from all these different angles. It's forcing them to be put together in a, in a new way. So we're, this is another sort of last big step until we get to pure abstraction. And you can see that taking apart. Remember what I just said earlier that keep thinking the arc of this is sort of the pulling apart of the natural world and showing us, showing us something in a new way. You know, I play guitar almost every day, but my guitar has never looked like that to me. But Picasso is showing me a new way to look at my guitar. I didn't know that that was possible to see it that way. And it starts to become very much about rhythm and uh, movement. There's so much energy in these pictures. It's almost kinetic because you're being forced to see all these things happening at the same time, which is the way we experience the world, right? All these parts are coming at us and our brain has to make sense out of them and create a whole. So that's what they're exploring with cubism. Cubism, for the most part, is not interested in color. 
because they are so hyper-focused on separating things and putting them back together, they felt that color wasn't necessary because that wasn't their goal. It was was less about sort of emotional and spiritual communication. This was more, in a way, scientific because they're looking at the world almost through, you know, these multi-prisms. But Towards the end of cubism, uh, color is starting to be reintroduced. This is still a painting of a bottle of rum in a newspaper, but we're getting further and further away from that um, three-dimensional world. And most people, and everyone loves to argue about what's the first abstract painting. Well, this is one of them. So this is 1909. This is two years after Picasso's masterpiece. And Picabia, another another artist working in Paris does this painting um, that has a, a strange word you can read there from the Catalan, from the Spanish region, uh, that means rubber. And he said, you know, this is a painting about, um, is about color, it's about form, but it's not connected to anything in the, in the representational world. And a lot of people say that's the first time in Western art, that someone has done that. Um, is it rubber like a bouncing ball? Is that circle sort of moving? Is, it, is that what the rhythm's about? And it's just color? Are those, you know, we talked about how color can do almost anything between the dark and the light tones. We've got all those planes moving together. So here we are with what most art historians would say is the first abstract painting. You know, I would love to talk to him about it. Was it an accident that he just was this something that came out of him over weeks or 10 minutes? I like to go to Orphism, which is an ism that you don't hear about in school very often. Um, I, li- I think that it's that bridge between cubism and abstract painting. So Orphism was a short-lived movement that was all about using the formal elements of art to create paintings. So they are not concerned with the representational world at all. They are really just looking at how beautiful a composition they can create using line, uh, color, tone. Um, So this is coming out of cubism, this idea of, great, we've deconstructed the world. Now let's use these elements to make something as beautiful as we can. And here you can see this painting by Kopka, this painting here, at the Salon in the Grand Palais in Paris in 1912. So they have the Salon every year and it's a huge deal. And if you want to know what's going on in contemporary art in Paris, the center of the art world, you go to the Salon every year and prizes are given out and careers can be made or broken in one Salon. And suddenly they've got all these young artists making these cubist pictures that they're submitting. You can see they call them the monsters. Look at these monsters. What are they doing? This is not art, right? Or not what we think art is. So guess what they did? They took all the cubist artists and the orphism artists we were just talking about who considered themselves part of cubism and they put them all in one room and guess which room everybody wanted to see the room filled with the art of the monsters everybody when they went to the salon of 1912 all they could talk about was the cubist room and here we have this painting by Kupko that we discussed there's sculpture by Modigliani I mean there's all sorts of you know, important artists, Picabia's wonderful painting here, all these important works thrust into this one room, creating a real sensation. People had never seen art used this way. They had never seen color used this way. One of the leaders of this Orphism movement was um, this artist depicted here. This is a self-portrait of Kupka. And he was very interested in sort of, again, that idea of freeing uh, colors, much like the Fovis did, from their traditional role, which was to reproduce the natural world, and using them to express feelings, to express spirituality. 
And this painting, while it is a self-portrait, this came, it's the same year as Picasso's masterpiece. He was really exploring, this is a portrait of color. This is a portrait of the color yellow. And again, it's hard to dial back and think how inventive all of this was, how exciting all of this was, but no one had ever tried to do this before. And so to have an artist sort of saying, I'm gonna do a self-portrait, but it's really about the color yellow was something very new. This is, I think, one of my favorite paintings of Paris. Can you all see the Eiffel Tower in there? So deconstructed, multiple perspectives, like we saw with Picasso and Brock with early cubism. But now we've got color and we've got movement. And they're actually throwing a lot of, you know, forms and colors in there just for the sake of beauty. Look at how wonderful and abstract these circles and shapes these planes stacked on top of each other, how beautiful they've become. We're right there at the door of pure abstraction. They were very interested in color theory. This, none of this was done haphazardly. A lot of this was very scientific. Um, the artists were going to the cafe and talking to the scientists. You know, everybody was talking about these ideas together. And so, you know, when you look at artists like Seurat, who was a post-impressionist, taking things apart and turning them into little dots and combining those dots to create a painting, you know, that wasn't because he was just OCD. That's because he was deconstructing in a scientific way how we see the world and reproducing it on canvas. So a lot of these artists are very interested in color theory and what colors do to us how colors make us feel. And um, Kupka, you know, is really a master at putting these colors together. They really felt blue was, you know, the most important color. It seemed to have the most uh, spiritual and emotional depth to them. So you see a lot of these early abstract painters playing on blue, but again, still just barely tied to the representational world, you know, much like the Matisses we were looking at, once you know the title, the cathedral, you see stained glass, right? And this painting here is actually a portrait of his wife. Do you see her? She's hiding right there. So she's barely there, right? This is just three years from Picasso's masterpiece. So almost there. I just love this idea that they can't, they can't quite let it go. They're almost to the edge. And when we look at these paintings, you know, they were starting to sort of pull everything apart and say, we can just worry about color. We can just worry about form. We can, you know, throw them all together or we can pull them all apart. These ideas they're exploring you can just see things being sort of ripped apart, or at least how we think we perceive the world or how we think we perceive art. And this is Robert Delaunay and his wife, Sonia. There's been a lot of re-examination of women artists and their role in a lot of this. And Sonia was a fascinating artist who, um, not only did she create these paintings, she was trying to take these ideas and put them in fashion and design and everything else. So spend time with her. Um, great pictures. But again, tying it back to something, the electric prisms is the name of this picture. But think about all those ideas that these, peop these artists are working with, from color theory on the scientific side to the spiritual and emotional side. How does this picture make you feel? One artist that I'd like to include, just because you'll see her in the news a lot recently, is an artist that you may not have been familiar with from Art History 101, Hilma Off Klimt. She was a Swedish uh, artist in the early 20th century. But what's interesting about her is, guess what? She's not in Paris. She's not hanging out in Picasso's studio or in the cafes. She's alone in Sweden. And she is interested in this spirituality called 
theosophy. And theosophy was all about communicating with the next world. And I do think it's worth noting that when there's lots of changes in science and there's changes in culture and art, there's often changes in religion because we start to see the world in different ways. And the, these theosophy believers thought that there was a way to communicate with people on the other side. And so they had this very elaborate systems of seances and all these things that they could use to communicate with the other side. And they didn't think they were witches. They thought they were scientists. There's got to be a way to do this. And to express the ideas that she and her um, fellow believers in the spiritual idea had, she created these paintings, which were really symbols of different ideas about theosophy. And so she created some of the first great abstract paintings about this spiritual idea. At the same time, in Paris, a lot of these same ideas, and you can look to that, are being explored as well. Completely independent. And it's very unlikely they would have known about each other. It's interesting, those are both women artists. Sonia Delaunay here and Hilma off Klimt. What's fascinating about Klimt is that she tried to have a few uh, exhibitions of her work. She sort of got away from the, the theosophy, philosophy, and did try to show exhibitions of just her paintings, her abstract paintings. No one was really interested. And when she died in 1944, she left all of her paintings to her nephew. And she said, I boxed these things up don't show them to anyone for 20 years. The world's not ready. And so they sat for 20 years, and in the 1960s, they opened these boxes up, and all these paintings came pouring out. And people were like, what are these? These are so, even in the 1960s, they weren't quite ready for them. They tried to give these to the um, National Museum in Sweden. They said, no, thank you. They set up a foundation, uh, started their own museum of her work, and now she is uh, a star of 20th century abstract art. So it's fascinating that re-examination um, going back uh, can bring someone out of obscurity like Clint. Isn't that wonderful? So we did it. This is Kandinsky. It's 1913. We have made it to pure abstraction. There are no objective elements to this painting, purely subjective, nothing representational, nothing tied back to the real world. And he's making a conscious effort not to tie us back to the real world. So this is our first painting about pure abstraction. And for him, it was about pure feelings and spirituality. And one thing I want you to remember when you leave today is how many times did Spalding say spirituality? Why did he keep saying that? When you go to look at these paintings, don't think of them as just an academic exercise or a decorative work of art. They were hell-bent on spirituality and trying to capture and portray what our souls experience. That's what they were after. It's not a scribbly mess, okay? That's the goal. So we have this new language. We are severed from the real world. We are not, uh, as artists, they have been liberated from trying to capture uh, Mother Nature. And it's all about our imaginations and our spirituality and looking at color the same way that we look at words in the same way that we look at music. Certain words, how we say them, can make us feel one way. The same with music. And now, for the first time, the same way with art. How can we use these colors and symbols to make us feel one way or the other? So, I always like to put these types of pictures in here because scale is important. If an artist does something big, that means he's really trying to show you something important. If You, you don't paint big if you're don't have anything to say, right? So 
I'm going to focus on Kandinsky here for a minute, and I want you, while you're looking at these paintings, imagine yourself in the museum, or even better yet, in Kandinsky's studio, and seeing these paintings for the very first time, and what sort of emotional response would you have? How would these paintings make you feel? So one idea that is new with these purely abstract paintings is that what you feel, what you experience when you look at this painting is going to be different from what I feel because we are bringing our own experiences, our own emotions, our own, you know, day to the picture. And it's okay not to get what Kandinsky thought he was after. It's okay for you to have your own experience with the painting. And again, that's a new idea. This is, you know, the, the birth of the modern is happening right now. So Kandinsky uh, died the same year as Klimt, uh, but a Russian artist. He uh, did a series of paintings, which we're going to look at. We've already looked at one already, uh, called his compositions. And he did these over the course of <clears throat> almost 30 years. And these were large-scale paintings that he would do when he felt like that he had had a breakthrough. And so he would have, you know, his smaller pictures he was working on, his studies, all these things. And when he felt like he had something important to say, he would do one of these big paintings, sort of summarizing all of what he had learned. Um, and that's why I wanted to put these in here so you can see these are big paintings. When you stand in front of them, he wanted you to be enveloped by them. And, and how it, when you play with scale like that in size, it's going to have a much more powerful impact. There were 10 of them. The first three got destroyed during World War II, and the pictures we have of them are not great. So I'm going to skip to number four, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the formal elements of art so that when you go to the High Museum, when you come to Spalding Nick's Fine Art, and you're standing in front of a beautiful abstract painting, you can say, all right, I'm going to take those formal elements of art and address each one and see what I get from this picture. So formal elements, uh, first we're going to talk about tone and what does tone mean? Well, for me, I like tone to be limited to sort of lights and darks. Is it, you know, shading from something that's, uh, you know, very light like these passages here to very dark here. And for me, and I say this with my artists all the time, tone can often be the most important element, and it's always overlooked. You can have a great composition, you can have beautiful color, but guess what? If you don't have good lights and darks, it will be flat. And if you want your painting to have movement and depth, tone is your friend. And so here, if you squint your eyes and you look at this painting, even though it's abstract, you can feel those planes pushing forward and back based on those tones. And even though this seems like a pretty violent picture, um, these passages, you know, there's a lot of blank space in this painting where it's really just represented by these light and dark planes of color. And when you sit in front of this picture, you know, how do those tones make you feel? You know, and I know it's hard to talk about feelings these days, but it's okay. These paintings were exercises in getting you to feel something new. And it's hard to look at these because you're like, great, I've seen it on a, you know, my coffee mug and my mouse pad or whatever. But these paintings were originally made so that you could feel something new. This one's a little more violent. A few years later, it's got a... a a much more, it's a lot more information in this painting. The colors are a lot darker. It even has, a, I would say, more, um, more earth tones to it in a way, with these uh, sort of forest greens and browns. But color, that's what they were, again, so concerned with. They really felt that every color had an emotional response for you. And Kandinsky even had his own color code where he assigned different emotional responses to each color. 
So he felt that each one of these colors could make you feel a different way and what happens when you combine them. And I love looking at pictures like this because you start to take it apart and you see here are the three primary colors over here. You know, there's a lot of greens and these browns and ochres, but there's a lot of yellows and blues and reds. Look at them right up against each other, just like over here. So again, these are paintings that you have to spend time with them. You're not going to get it in 30 seconds and read the little plaque and move on. It's the kind of picture where you need to spend five minutes, go get a cup of coffee, and come spend five minutes more because they have a lot to say. And again, I put these in here so you can think about scale. And I think it's fascinating why this one's hung so high. Is it supposed to, it, does it feel more monumental hung that way? I'm not sure, because this one's hung. 60 on center is what most museums hang their work. And it's interesting they chose to put this one up so high. It's in Russia somewhere, and if you ever go to the museums in Russia, they got the door windows open, there's no guards anywhere, so maybe they were like, well, if we hang it a little bit higher, then no one's going to mess with it, so who knows. <laughs> I love this one. This is the sixth one of these large composition pictures. And you can see it here on the left. But this one to me has got lots of not only like weight to it, but the, I love these, again, tone, darkest darks and lightest lights. This one to me is most successful in that way. Color is still there. You've got your reds and blues and yellows, but the really dark darks versus these really light lights, that for me is what makes a painting impactful. And he's really playing with that throughout this composition. So we've talked about color. We've talked about uh, tone. And now we're talking about line. So again, it's a fun way to take these paintings apart with these formal elements. So look, we've got line there. If you look at this painting and just look for the lines, look at these interesting passages that he's created. Moving our eye around. Often these paintings to me feel like they're swirling you know, within this rectangular space, moving us up and around and back down and over and over again. You can feel that motion sort of happening in a lot of these pictures. So line, again, something that he's using to help move us through the painting, to make us feel one way or another. These, to me, look kind of menacing and sharp. I don't like these lines, but these over here seem, they've got different colors. They, for some reason, they look like they're more our friend, right? So just simple lines, what they can do to the composition, not attached to the representational world at all. And again, for scale, just so you can imagine standing in front of this picture would be bigger than it is on this screen and spending time with this painting, you know, what, what would you walk away from it with? It's amazing how hard it is to find pictures of paintings on the wall. So here is a picture of Kandinsky's eighth composition, which most people consider his masterpiece, as good as it got. So here we have all those elements. We've got color, line, tone. Now we're looking at shapes within this picture. He said this was his most complex of all the compositions that he created. Over 30 oil studies and watercolors went into creating this one painting, and it's anchored by, at the middle of this hurricane, which we've been talking about with these pictures, this right here. This is the eye of the hurricane, right? When you're standing in front of this painting, guess where you're standing? Right there and it connects directly to you, and then you experience the painting sort of swirling around. And then you have the chance to go through and examine all of these elements that he's thrown at us. It feels so chaotic, but once you start taking it apart, you can get more and more out of it. Look over here. We talked about those tones, those passages of calm. If you look just at the bottom of this painting, look how calm it is. We look at the color. Look at this incredible color play. You know, looks to me like an Ida Kohlmeier from 50 years later. 
And then line, look at these wonderful lines. The, you know, we have this rectangle piercing this cycloptic eye, this oval here. And these lines, you know, that's how we understand perspective. Are they, you know, pushing us back further into the composition? And then all these wonderful shapes. And these shapes did not happen haphazardly. He spent time figuring out which shapes worked for him, which shapes he needed to create this painting. So a lot of time and effort and thought. And these paintings can be overwhelming when you see them in person. That's why I wanted to put this presentation together so that when you do see this painting or something like it, that you can comfortably stand in front of it and say, all right, what do you got? Let's, 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 let's have a, a connection right now and see what we can find. And again, I'm always looking for pictures of paintings in the museum so that we can all get a little bit closer to Moscow or St. Petersburg and see these pictures because they don't travel very often. But again, for scale, imagine standing in front of this picture. Imagine what, you know, feelings might come up looking at a painting like this. This is his eighth composition, which to me is very different. We've looked at very expressive painting, brushwork, lots of texture, and suddenly he's become very hard-edged. And he used to do these paintings that were very expressive on one side, and you'd flip it around, and it would be geometric on this side. So here he's using those same elements that we've been talking about for the last five minutes, but in a different way. It's still line, it's still color, it's still tone and forms, but look how different that picture is than that picture. So he's feeling like he's made a step forward in abstraction, in pure abstraction, and he's showing us something different. And this looks so graphic, right? You can just imagine this on a t-shirt. But when, they, when this was made, nothing like it had come before. You know, I have a t-shirt with this on it. <laughs> That's probably the closest I'll get to this painting anytime soon. But if you had never seen anything like this and you walked into his studio and saw this, imagine how you would feel. It's something new, right? It's, we're, we're so oversaturated with imagery that, and history, I mean everything, that it's hard for us to step back and realize what an impact these pictures would have made on their contemporaries. And again, just for scale. But how kinetic and how energetic. And again, that I feel like this is that cycloptic eye. It's almost like it's been moved up, sort of a, the godlike eye looking down on us. But all of these elements, you know, being used in a new way. And I love how, you know, here's this plane delineated by this triangular line, but this really soft changes in this beautiful blue. You look closely at, you know, looks to me like uh, a Rothko, this wonderful fading from the black to the orange and here from the yellow to the blue to the purple. So much to see, so much to unpack. These paintings got really crazy in the uh, 30s. They become much more like you would expect from a surrealist, like someone like Jean Miro. Um, but again, big, colorful, new ideas. Uh, this is sort of at the end of his uh, arc of being, you know, exploring abstraction. This to me looks like something, it's either galactic or it's something that's happen, happening in like a, a cell in our body somewhere. So again, that idea of spirituality, the soul, that's what these artists were interested in. And that's what they wanted to connect. When they wanted to connect, they wanted to connect with your soul. So that was the goal. So when you look at a great work of art, especially from this period, these first steps towards abstraction, I want you to remember that they're trying to speak to your soul. And that is a, that's a noble effort right there, right? So when you look at these paintings, think about that. Let Open yourself up a little bit. 
and see what you find. Kandinsky was very smart. He said, it's not just abstract paintings that can connect with you this way. He said, all art can connect with you this way. We're just trying to do it in a new way. So you can connect in a spiritual way to the last judgment in the same way Kandinsky would have said to his picture right here, 500 years later. So he was very diplomatic in saying all art is capable of this connection. It's not just us. It's everybody who creates art and who does it deeply, truthfully, can establish that connection. So I'm going to just quickly race through the rest of the 20th century. All these isms that you learned about in school, now that you have this background from our brief discussion, it's fun to see how these influences from these early 20th century first modern artists, how they affected everybody who came after them. And you can very much see Kandinsky in his contemporary Malevich's supremacist pictures, uh, to Mondrian, you know, taking, again, that idea of reducing things to its most simple elements. Here, he's often trying to express ideas that he associated with music, I put this in here again just because I wanted to hammer in that spiritual side. Art is higher than reality and has no direct re relation to reality. Okay, that's a lofty statement. To approach the spiritual in art, one will make as little use as possible of reality because reality is opposed to the spiritual. He believed that the real world and the spiritual world were two very separate places. We find ourselves in the presence of an abstract art. Art should be above reality, otherwise it would have no value for man. He believed that the purpose of art was to awaken your spiritual side. That's pretty wild to think coming from somebody whose pictures today, would you have thought that if you walked into the museum and saw that on the wall? Was that the first thing you would have thought of, that he was trying to connect to your spiritual side? We talked about Miro just a minute ago. Um, very much, you can see in the wake of Kandinsky, the action painting of the abstract expressionists. If you ever stood in front of this Jackson Pollock, it is enormous, just like one of those big compositions by Kandinsky. And same amount of turbulence, right, that we saw on some of those large scale compositions by Kandinsky. Rothko, talk about a spiritual side. If you've ever been to the Rothko Chapel in Dallas or Houston, I mean, I walked in there, they were, everyone was weeping. And I've seen, I mean, people, I mean, you'd be surprised. I, we had our gallery now for 18 years. I, I can't tell you how many times people have come in, stood in front of something, and started crying. So that connection, that spiritual side, that emotional side, that's what Rothko was after. And if you spend time with these paintings, they will reveal a lot. Again, as we get into the 1960s, 1970s, this to me looks like that composition for that early Kandinsky that we looked at. And then those hard edged pictures of Frank Stella and pop art and uh, even op art with someone like Victor Vassarelli. A lot of those ideas that we saw being explored by those artists in the 19 teens leading up to World War I was really this like all of this excitement happening, all of this change happening so fast you know, in Paris. And World War I sort of blew that up, but um, those ideas continued uh, through the end of the 20th century. So, a little plug for our gallery. Right now we have a beautiful show up this spring, and guess what? It's three Georgia artists, three female artists, and three abstract artists. So I thought it was a, a good, very fitting for today. We have um, new work by Catherine Sando, she's out of Savannah, Georgia. She often takes something representational from nature and plays with that. This is, if you were ever looking on the side of the road in South Georgia into a ditch, you would see the Katniss plant. And here she is playing with that form in her work. Susan Hables out of Athens, Georgia. Um, she is uh, celebrated for her design work. Uh, this is really her, her most serious foray into fine art, and she created uh, this wall of cut works on paper, very Matisse-esque, 
uh, as well as sculpture and uh, really beautiful paintings. And then last but not least, um, Evan Hartwell is a uh, young Atlanta-based painter. She's African-American, and she is exploring the idea that it wasn't just a bunch of white guys in Europe who came up with abstraction, that we have been seeing abstraction uh, in different ways all over the world. So she looks to a lot of those non-Western influences in her art. But it's a really fun show, and it's amazing. You know, you sometimes you get artists work together, and they don't play well together. But it's so fun when you have a show like this, and they all make each other sing. So thank you so much for joining me on this quick uh, sprint through the origins of abstract art. Um, I hope the next time that you go to the museum and you're confronted with one of these challenging pictures um, that you connect with it and that you learn something, you feel something new. So thank you.